is everybody? All right. Talking with Henry Chen. Look, again, thank you so much for being today. We're live on Facebook, live on YouTube, live on Facebook, and everywhere else in the world to present your fantastic lesson. My name is Benjamin Hatfield, I know Dive Pirates. We're presenting Dan Orr today and his diving safety lessons learned. Okay. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the origin or genesis of this presentation. This actually has to do with um, dealing with diving fatalities. And what I'm going to do during the presentation is we're going to deconstruct a double fatality that took place at Florida Keys a few years ago. We're going to talk about each step in that process, and we're going to start out with what we see, what we saw, of course, having a couple of dead divers. We're going to go from there and talk about things that we learned from that accident, that unfortunate accident, uh, and also other recommendations on how you can prevent those things from happening in the, in the future. Well, we all enjoy diving, and this actually is a photo that was taken of me. That's me on the right-hand side, not on the left, uh, but that's me on the right. And uh, I was diving in Cuba uh, last December, and fabulous place to dive. So we enjoy the sport because we see things that other people cannot. We enjoy things that other people may not be able to experience, and it is a fantastic sport. Uh, last year, I celebrated my 75th birthday by diving in Little Cayman. This is the Bloody Bay Wall in Little Cayman, also another fantastic place to dive. So. Diving is one of the most enjoyable sports there is, but it doesn't uh, come without risk. When you look at data, and this is data from Divers Alert Network, and I had the pleasure of working at Divers Alert Network for 23 years, starting out there as the director of training, developing all their training programs, including the Dan Oxygen program, and then ultimately uh, I became the president of the organization and retired from there in 2013. But when you look at the data from uh, the most recent published report, which is data from 2018, you can see that 55 U.S. and Canadian citizens and 45 others from other parts of the world uh, were involved in diving-related fatalities. Now, that number may seem high, but when you consider the fact that there are tens of millions of recreational divers doing probably hundreds of millions of open-water dives, uh, the incidence of injury or incidence of fatality is indeed relatively low. So let's talk about how people, sometimes very creatively, can get themselves in trouble doing other things. So the odds of dying are 1 in, 1 in 2,317 in base jumping. Base jumping, of course, where you jump off of some structure and possibly glide, hopefully, ultimately to the ground. Read the sound on that? And hopefully, uh, hopefully that, that person didn't uh, did survive that incident. Going on to other things, for example, like swimming. The odds of dying in swimming are 1 in 56,587. Cycling, 1 in over 92,000. Skydiving, 1 in over 101,000. Hang gliding, 1 in over 116,000. And, of course, things, for example, like being involved in horse riding. And... Uh, being in Idaho, living in Idaho, and living in Driggs, Idaho, as we do, we, we find creative ways of being able to do things in the wintertime. Uh, and scuba diving, one in 211,864. And then finally, table tennis, one in 250,597. So you can see that the odds of dying fall somewhere between, odds uh, of dying scuba diving, but fall somewhere between horseback riding and table tennis. So it is relatively safe, even though. Um, you do hear on the news sometimes whenever there's a diving-related accident, of course, it's all over the news because people say it's very dangerous for it, which it is not. So looking at additional data and having worked at Divers Alert Network, I spent a lot of my time looking at uh, diving fatality data. Um, and from their annual diving report, 50% of fatalities were from that 40 to 59 age group. And that really tends to be the most active diving population now uh, in the diving area. And when you look at uh, some data that was collected by scubacom.com, uh, uh, you can see that almost two-thirds of the diving population are over the age of 40. So when you go out on a diving excursion, on a dive book, for example, you're probably looking at people your same, same age. Uh, even though there are people who are recruited to come into the sport who are much younger, the people who are the driving force that really built the sport were the baby boomers, and they continue to be the driving force because, for one thing, we have time on our hands. 
we have resources, and we certainly have the desire uh, to continue to scuba dive. So going on now, approximately 34% of the fatalities from that 40 to 59 age group were cardiac related. That tends to be the biggest issue now in diving safety, uh, is back, especially now post-COVID, because so on now, a lot of people did not uh, take, take the time to go visit their physician uh, during COVID, and so they've probably gone without regular uh, checkups for the last couple of years. 60% of those that had cardiac involvement had signs or symptoms that they recognized were cardiac related, uh, but they went diving anyway and died on the dock, which makes no sense. So if there's something that doesn't feel right, simply don't dive. So don't really do something we're not fully physically prepared to do. Divers older than 49 uh, had a risk of a cardiac incident uh, almost 13 times greater than younger divers. 39% of the fatalities were people who were certified for one year or less, which kind of makes sense because these are people that have limited experience. Limited experience and skills to draw from, and therefore when something happens, uh, they really don't have the skills to be able to deal with it effectively uh, as people would who had more, more experience. 35% of people who were certified for more than 10 years, which I can tell you that means absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because it has nothing to do with the person's experience. It simply means they had a certification card and they've wallowed the purse for 10 years or longer. It has nothing to do with their ability. I, I mentioned that because I travel quite a bit and I dive quite a bit in various places. And I always have people that come up to me and say, well, yeah, I've been diving for 10 years. What does that mean? It means nothing to me at all. When was your last dive? What kind of dives have you done? Uh, so just because you've been certified for a long time doesn't mean uh, that you're really a qualified diver. For example, my brother and I both got certified initially in 1964. And during that time, I've done probably a little over 10,000 open water dives. My brother's probably done 400, 500 maybe. So, and he has been diving the last five or six years at least. Uh, and so therefore our qualification as divers are really entirely different and I'm much more qualified than he is. 88% of these fatalities are people who died uh, on the first dive of their dive series. And in fact, I gave this presentation in uh, Long Beach last weekend and somebody said, well, the way to deal with that is simply skip the first dive. <laughs> Sounds logical, but it doesn't really work that way. And what this means to me um, is that you have people who are coming back to the sport who've been away for a year or two or three or four because of COVID or even longer because of family obligations or career obligations. And they want to come back to the sport at the same level that they were before they stopped. Their ego wouldn't allow them to go back and take a refresher course or take a nine dive or do things easier slowly. They want to come back at the same level they were when they stopped diving. Of course, you can't really do that. And this is a real serious problem also in diving. So in 2008, um, when I worked at Dive Alert Network, we actually analyzed nearly 1,000 diving fatality records. So we looked at 947 fatality cases uh, that occurred between 1992 and 2003. Now, the reason we chose that period of time is because those are records that were most complete, that had enough information where we could determine what all of the steps were that turned that dive into a dive with a fatal outcome. And so they did, and we did a root cause analysis of those fatality cases, and it was published in the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society Journal uh, in 2008, and the author was Dr. Petar Denoble. If you want a copy of that, actually you can probably do a search online and be able to find it, but uh, if you want a copy of it, just drop me an email. I'll give you my email address at the end of the presentation and drop me an email, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of that uh, article. So what that did, that research did what I called a cascade towards eternity. So it identified the triggering event. So what was it? There was some action that turned that dive from an enjoyable recreational dive into something where the person couldn't get out of that cascade and ultimately had a fatal outcome. So the triggering event, a harmful action, or something was done that didn't correct the situation, so it got worse and that incapacitated the diver and ultimately the diver died. And, and you, when you look at the data, the DAN data, about 70% of the fatalities are labeled drownings. The reason for that is that most coroners or medical examiners uh, don't really know the details necessary to determine what the actual physiological cause was. And so they simply say the person is wet, they're dead, therefore they drown, so it's a drown. Now, what I like to look at, what is most interesting to me, is that triggering event. So what took place that caused that diver to get into that cascade that couldn't get themselves out of and ultimately resulted in fatality? 
So the definition of a trigger is the earliest identifiable root cause that transformed an unremarkable dive into an emergency leading to a fatal outcome. So when you look at the triggering events, the number one triggering event in that 947 fatalities was running out of breathing gas underwater. So 41% of the triggering events were running out of breathing gas underwater, which to me makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. We have a pressure gauge that tells us how much breathing gas we have. We have a partner that helps us monitor our breathing gas. So therefore we don't run out of our breathing gas, neither does our partner. Uh, and it makes no sense to me to run out of breathing gas underwater. Still, over 400 divers would be alive today if they were able to manage their breathing gas supply. And that means that over 400 divers would be alive today if they and their buddy collectively could have managed their breathing gas supply, and they could not. So when you look at all of the trigger events, uh, out of breathing gas is number one, entrapment where they really have gone somewhere that uh, they shouldn't be. In fact, I was uh, Betty, my wife, who is also... Uh, worked at Dan for 23 years. We were actually looking at some details of the fatality that took place a week ago Friday uh, in a spring in the Florida Keys, where the person got into a spring, went through a restriction, but couldn't get back out, got stuck. And got stuck to the point where it couldn't get out, finally ran out of breathing gas and breath. So entrapment is an issue. Equipment problems, I have a real issue with that term because the equipment problems to me implies a design flaw with the equipment. And we really don't have that anymore. That's very rare uh, to have anything where the equipment actually fails. I think it's this, problems with equipment. So what I've seen and what I've reviewed as far as diving uh, accident data is it's user error more frequently than any sort of equipment failure. And then you have rough water trauma, buoyancy, and inappropriate gas. So why did an accident occur? And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of use our way back machine to kind of work our way back through this double fatality and talk about all the different pieces that took place, all the different actions that took place that resulted in the fatality uh, involving two divers. So we're going to start with what we see. We know that there are two bodies. Two bodies were recovered. The first diver that was recovered at 1,100 PSI in our scuba cylinder. The second dead diver, with no air remaining in his scuba cylinder, had a death grip on the first diver's primary second stage. So they found them together underwater. The diver who had run out of breathing gas underwater had a hold of her second stage and had a death grip on it, and they were both dead laying on bottom. Possible issues, no recent practice of emergency skills. Emergency skills like maybe doing an emergency ascent or jettisoning your weights or going into a exchange of breathing gas. Think about when you got certified and you did this training, you did these skills in the pool, and they're all complex cyclomotor skills. Think about the last time you actually practiced those skills. So when was the last time you practiced exchanging breathing gas with a diving partner? When was the last time you actually jettisoned your weights out of your either weight integrated BCD or your weight belt? So when was the last time you did that? Uh, those are all important skills that people don't practice. They don't practice at all. They're complex psychomotor skills that have to be recently practiced and reinforced to be used in an emergency. Lack of familiarity they're sharing in an emergency. Again, that's a complex skill that people don't practice. And if you don't practice it, you can't use it, especially in a crisis. Possible problem deploying air supply. So you have to be able to quickly and efficiently deploy your octopus or safe second, whatever you want to call it, to satisfy that diver's need for breathing gas. And you don't want to lose control of your personal air supply. And evidently, that's what happened in this case. Because that person who was out of breathing gas had a hold of that other person's second stage that she should have been breathing from. And they both drowned. Okay, this is a photo I took in North Carolina of a diver coming out of a quarry. <clears throat> and you can see here, this is the octopus, or say second, whatever you want to call it. Uh, nice and tight in there. I mean, it's not going to be dragging along, but also you can't use it. So there's no way in the world that person is going to be able to deploy that quickly enough to satisfy your need for air. So if you're right in front of that person going like this, I need to air. That person's not going to be able to do that. So what are you going to do? You know the one is working in that person's mouth. That's the one you're going to go for. Okay, and this is pressure gauge down here. So he's got all that stuff all tangled up in a big mess. And somebody sent me this photo. This is a person who has lost control of her breathing gas supply. So this is her primary second stage. And she has let someone else control it. And so you don't want that to happen. That's one reason why you need to practice those skills because they're complex 
psychomotor skills that needed practice and reinforced. Okay, going on. Divers attempting to share air tried unsuccessfully to jettison integrated weights from the out-of-air diver to BCD. They originally were seen trying to put air in that person's BCD and they had no air because they ran out of breathing gas. So nothing would go into the BCD. So they were trying to jettison the weights from the BCD. Also, I don't like to show photographs unless I point out something that I think is air. Right there and there. Because the strap is loose and that possibly could cause that person to lose that cylinder out of the backpack. But possible issues here, no recent practice of emergency skills. That is a complex psychomotor skill. A weight integrated BCD requires you to unclip, pull forward, and drop, or pull forward and drop. It's not, a, it's not an easy motion. If you can imagine trying to jettison all of your weights while trying to exchange air at the same time, you can't do that. You don't have three hands or four hands. You have two. So you can only use one to get one weight pocket out. And there are situations that I'm aware of where a person has ditched one weight pocket and they're still negatively buoyant. Because it's a chronic problem in the diving world that people overweight themselves. Because you'll find weights not only in those weight pockets, but other places too. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you need to make sure that you're practicing skills that you that need to be reinforced. But no pre-dive equipment familiarization. You need to make sure that you and your partner understand both divers' equipment. So I want to make sure that I understand my diving companion's equipment as well as I do my own. So I spent a lot of time practicing. In fact, I was traveling, and this I was on a little board, and I, because of weight restrictions, I decided not to bring my own BCD. So I decided to rent the BCD from the little board. So it was, a, it was a BCD I had not used before. And so here I am practicing removing those weight pockets. So my diving companion and I practiced for probably at least 45 minutes getting rid of those weight pockets while trying to do other things at the same time. And then I realized, in my opinion, um, it was too complex a movement, a series of movements to be able to do it quickly. So I chose to dive with a weight belt because I want to have quick release. And to me, quick release is one motion, all the weights are gone. And the only way to do that is with a weight belt. Okay, going on. There we go. Um, look at this. Um, trim weights, where you have weights in places that divers normally don't put weights. So here we have somebody that has leads that's sewn in, or not sewn in, but threaded through the straps uh, to give them additional negative buoyancy. And I think that is a serious problem because if you were going to rescue this person, you wouldn't expect weights to be back here. You would ditch the weights out of here, uh, out of the BCD, but you wouldn't look anyplace else. And I have a personal issue with trim weights because I think trim weights are, are very dangerous to use because they are pockets that have weights in them that you can't get rid of. There's no way in the world that person can get rid of that weight. If you had trim weight pockets like these, there's no way in the world you can get back there and get rid of those weights. And generally, they're the same color as your wetsuit or dry suit and possibly the cylinder. And so a rescuer may not even know they're there. And I know situations where once all the weights were taken out of the BCD, the person was still negatively buoyant because they had so much lead in these trim weight pockets. So be very cautious about trim weight pockets. And, of course, you need to make sure you're constantly reinforcing uh, the, the procedures in dealing with a diving emergency, especially out of breathing gas. But there was no practice in this case of a complete emergency scenario. So if you can think about the course you took um, and the instructor came to you, you're in the bottom of the pool, you're going to exchange air, whatever method you use. So the instructor comes up to you, you exchange air, exchange air for a couple of breaths. The instructor then gives you the okay. The instructor moves to the next person. Well, there was no ascent involved in that. And there are situations where people actually started exchanging air, but never left the bottom until they both ran out of air. So it always has to be part of a complete continuum. Uh, so anytime you go into exchange of air, it's got to involve an ascent. So when we were doing training, both for science divers, when I worked at Florida State, and also in Ohio, when we were training recreational divers, we never did any sort of exchange of air that did not involve an ascent. Every single time it had to involve in a set. Okay, next. Divers attempting to share air tried unsuccessfully to inflate the diver's BCD. So we know that the diver who ran out of air didn't have any air in the cylinder, so therefore that BCD wasn't going to work. So they were trying to inflate the BCD of the other person who was coming to that person's aid. Possible issues? Diver providing air, the BC hose was not connected. It was touching the inflator 
but it wasn't pushed on to the point where air would come out of the cylinder into the BCD, which again is not uncommon. People will put it together, but you have to, before you get in the water, make sure that air is coming out of the cylinder into the BCD. Got to make sure everything is working before you ever get in the water. And they didn't do that in this case. No, we're incomplete pre dive equipment check, but had they checked their equipment, including making sure that it functioned properly, they would have caught that. And so that wouldn't have been a problem. And it has to ensure proper functioning of all the equipment before you get in the water. And that is for yourself and your, and your diving companions. Oh, also, a nearby diver was seen coming to the diver's uh, assistance, and because the, the person who ran out of breathing gas, there was really nobody nearby, because there was no formal buddy relationship. And so when that person was in distress, somebody was seen coming across the bottom very quickly to his aid. Now, think about that. Think about the fact that you're running to somebody, and all of a sudden you have to do something. Well, you're going to be out of breath, and you're going to be you're going to be out of breath to the point where if you have to actually take your regulator out and go back and forth and exchange the regulator, uh, then you may be in distress as well. So you need to make sure that you are close to your diving companions. Okay, nearby diver was seen coming across to assist. The assisting diver did not have an octopus or safe second. What they had was a combined octopus power inflator. And that was an issue because that neither diver was familiar, even the person that owned the equipment was not familiar with the operation of a combined octopus and inflator. And they didn't know how to use an emergency. The person had never breathed from that because with that combined octopus and inflator, when you are giving away the, the safe second or your octopus, then you breathe off of this. That person had never done that. She'd never done that. She'd never practiced uh, in the use of her own equipment in an emergency. No recent practice of emergency skills. Again, skills are complex psychomotor skills. They've got to be reinforced to be used effectively. No formal buddy relationship. Everybody was in the ocean. So nobody had an assigned buddy, and there's no formal buddy relationships. Out of air diver, this is an interesting thing. The out of air diver was seen to push somebody away. So somebody came to his assistance, and they think that he saw the fact that she was also low on air, and so rather than to take the air she had, he pushed her away, pushed her up towards the surface and actually saved her life. So he reportedly saw that she was low on air and she surfaced successfully because he pushed her away. Possible issues here. Oh, here's something else too. Loose strap on a, on a cylinder. Okay, possible issues. Unable to initiate an emergency scent, probably because they couldn't get rid of their weights or inflate a BC. No practice of the complete emergency scenario. So again, they didn't it never gone to the point where they practiced that when you exchange air, that has to involve an ascent of the surface. Okay, the out of air diver attempted to share air with the nearest diver. Possible issues, no formal buddy relationship. No communication before or during the dive because nobody had a, a diving companion. And it's not uncommon to see that where everybody is in the same ocean, therefore they have the same ocean buddies. No situational awareness because they weren't aware of their depletion of their breathing gas supply and they weren't exchanging any information during the dive. No plan for managing emergencies. No use of solo diving equipment or techniques. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about solo diving. There are people who do that. There are training programs that teach you how to solo dive. And it's essentially like doing uh, overhead environment diving or cave diving where you have a lot of redundancy. So if something happens, you have redundant air supplies and everything else. And had they had that, or had they even talked about that, uh, then this never would have gone into a fatality situation. Okay, out of air diver was sinking towards the bottom. Possible issues here, poor buoyancy control, because he couldn't uh, inflate a BC because he didn't have, didn't have air in his cylinder. Uh, did not jettison his waist, he didn't, didn't know how. Overweighted, and again, trim weight pockets, and here's somebody with two trim weight pockets. And you can put a lot of weight in those trim weight pockets, and you can't get rid of it yourself. No recent practice of critical emergency skills. And you want to make sure that you are never in a situation where you're underwater and your pressure gauge looks like that. When I worked at Florida State, I was the associate dive safety officer down there. And uh, our students commonly would go into springs. Most often they'd go into a spring that didn't involve a cave. But there were places out there where you could easily get into a cave system. And so I would warn the students and I would tell them, that you don't want to be in a situation where you watch your pressure gauge or spend the rest of your life watching your pressure gauge go to zero, which unfortunately happens. 
Possible issues here, no overall safety philosophy, no pre-dot communication. They didn't really talk to each other about the dives they were going to make or things that were going to happen. No communication during the dive because there was nobody nearby. They were all basically driving solo. No situational awareness. They weren't aware or they weren't communicating um, the progression of their dive plan or the use of the breathing gas. They weren't communicating at all. It was the second dive of the day. This, to me, is the first thing I look at when I hear about a fatality. What dive of the day was it? And a lot of those are the second dive of the day. Second dive of the day, possible issues here, did not change cylinders between dives. That's exactly what happened. That person did not change cylinders, even though there were other cylinders on the boat. They didn't change cylinders. They used the same cylinder uh, on the second dive. There's a, a case in the Florida Keys where a, a little a, a young man, and I think he was 17, was diving with a companion, and they were spearfishing. And the father was driving the boat. And so they did a dive early in the morning, went down, spent about an hour or so on the bottom. They came back and they were moving to another dive site. And when they got to the second dive site, one of the kids looked over the side and saw a big grouper on the bottom, jumped in with a spear gun, went to the bottom, ran out of air at 105 feet, did an emergency ascent, and died in his father's arms uh, because he was using that cylinder for the second dive without changing cylinders. Okay, no appreciation for diving risks, no plan of action for managing emergencies, no pre-dive communication, no pre-dive safety checks or pre-dive briefing, overestimation of your diving ability. And this was a perfect, absolutely perfect day. Calm water, no current, no wave action whatsoever, visibility probably over 100 feet. So clear water, calm seas, no current. Depth was approximately 60 feet, so it wasn't really a very deep dive. Possible issues. Lack of appreciation or understanding of diving hazards. So again, you have to make sure you understand that even though diving is a fantastic sport, it's not without risk. And of course, a photo here of a person who was having all kinds of problems, losing his cylinder there, actually trolling for buddies with an octopus there. Uh, no plan for managing emergencies and a cavalier attitude towards safety. And people were involved in what I call the same ocean buddy system. No communication regarding risk and how to manage emergency. They didn't talk about these things because they've been doing this before. They've been diving together for a long time, a couple of years. Uh, that's how they always dive. And nothing ever happened before, so they didn't expect it to happen now. Uh, and so they had this very cavalier attitude towards the safety of everybody in the dive group. No discussion about solo diving. Cavalier attitude towards safety, as I mentioned. No culture of diving safety. So you have to understand that safety is a part of what you do. It shouldn't really detract from the enjoyment. It really should heighten the enjoyment because that takes one of those those uh, things off of your shoulders because you know the dive or you're, you hope the dive is going to go really well because you've thought about all those things or as many things as you can to make sure all those things are covered before you get in the water. So why do accidents occur? Diving is inherently safe, but it can be and certainly is very, very unforgiving of mistakes. This uh, photograph, by the way, that's me on the left-hand side here. This is a wreck called the Prince Eugen. The Prince Eugen is a German battleship that was captured at the end of World War II, and it was left fully intact, and it was towed to Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands. And I happened to be in Kwajalein, uh, actually doing some lectures and some other things while I was there, but um, Kwajalein Atoll, they took me out to dive this wreck, and the Prince Eugen, once it got to uh, Kwajalein after World War II, it was towed to Bikini to be used in, as a ship in the atomic bomb test. So it survived two atomic bomb blasts. And they towed it back to Kwajalein trying to figure out why it didn't sink. A storm hit, it rolled over and sank. <laughs> so, so two atomic bombs could not send her to the bottom, and Mother Nature did. And she's upside down, completely, fully, absolutely intact. I mean, a fabulous, fabulous room. Uh, great dive site. So why do divers make mistakes? Because of having incomplete knowledge, not having all the relevant facts. You need to have as much information as you can because of all the decisions that you have to make during the dives you make. So knowledge is very, very important to dive safety. Poor communication, not sharing all the information with diving companions. I want to make sure that I share everything I can with the people I dive with. I want to make sure that my, my diving companions know as much about the dive as I do, because we have to make the same decisions underwater, and those decisions are going to affect me as well. Changing conditions. Sometimes you get in the water, and it's absolutely ideal, and then within a few minutes, the clouds come in, the wind picks up, and so the conditions may change. And sometimes those conditions can actually push you a little bit beyond what your experience level is 
uh, and make that a much more hazardous dive. So if I'm in a situation where I see that conditions are changing, then generally speaking, I'll abort the dive and come back to the surface. So pressure is also a reason why people make mistakes. And this is not water pressure or ambient pressure. This actually is things, for example, like time pressure. So there are times, and I tend to be a very slow, very methodical person. So I want to make sure that I'm always early whenever I do things. And I want to make sure that I have the time to be able to make all the decisions and all the things necessary to be, for me to prepare myself and my equipment for the dive I'm going to make. And also, once you're in the water, I don't want to have anybody push me to swim or move faster than I want to move. I tend to be, again, very slow and methodical. And I tend to move at the pace of the slowest person in that dive group, which tends to be me. <laughs> because I'm there to enjoy the dive. I don't want to race around underwater trying to see everything when I'm missing some of the really best things. So don't allow people to pressure you into moving more quickly than you're prepared for uh, or more quickly than you want to enjoy the dive. Peer pressure, where people try to convince you to do things that are beyond your skill level or beyond your experience level. When I worked at Florida State, um, we did a lot of kind of aggressive cave exploration and cave diving to support the science department there. And the staff that I had were all volunteers, and they did cave diving on the weekends uh, on their own. And there was a young man named Sherwood, and he was going out one weekend with a couple of other divers to go into a cave to what, do what they call push line. And that is to take the cave line and move it further back into the cave system. And it was going to be a two-day series of dives. And Sherwood, uh, after the first day, they were all sitting around the campfire that night. And Sherwood said, you know, guys, um, it was a tough dive today. And he said, I'm an experienced cave diver, but I think this has really gone to the limit of what I can do. So he said, no, I'm just not going to dive tomorrow. They said, oh, come on, Sherwood, you can do it. You're very experienced. And, um, they, they ultimately convinced him to do that dive on the second day, and he died on that dive. On that dive. So don't ever allow people to pressure you or push you into a dive that you don't feel you're prepared for. Complexity, overly complex equipment, procedures, and circumstances. This is a photo taken of me in the Beagle Channel in Ushuaia, Argentina. Uh, this was the day, a couple days before I was going to do my first trip to the Antarctic. And what I was doing, I was using equipment that I had not used before, uh, and I wanted to make sure that I was experienced in the use of that equipment. And Brett may re recognize that BCD, that's his BCD that I brought up for that trip. <laughs> Thank you, Brett. Uh, and so this is equipment that I hadn't used before, so I wanted to make sure that I was fully prepared and practiced with it by doing a few dives in the Beagle Channel under similar, not exactly the same, but similar conditions before I attempted to do that or use that equipment in the Antarctic because the Antarctic is a much more unforgiving place. And if something happened there, you would literally be days away from any kind of assistance. Complexity, too many firsts, doing too many things for the first time. Uh, for example, uh, I have a lot of diving experience and I also take photographs, but I never take a camera on the first dive. Because the first dive, especially in a place that I'm not familiar with or haven't dived there before, I don't want anything to complicate my ability to be able to do the things I do as a sick dive. So you want to make sure that you don't get involved in too many firsts, like doing a night dive for the first time, while wearing a dry suit for the first time, or while doing a deep dive for the first time, while taking photographs for the first time, because you can actually overwhelm yourself by too many firsts. And this would be the first time using or doing something, or even the first time in a long time using or doing something. Because again, that refers back to the point where divers have been out of the water for a couple of years now because of COVID, they're coming back to the sport and they haven't been diving in a long time. That means their skills are rusty. So this creates, when you're doing things for the first time and too many things for the first time, creates something called task loading. And task loading is where you're overwhelmed by all these things going on at one time. And you're having a hard time coping with it. And you get something called perceptual narrowing. You can only visualize things in a very narrow field. But even more serious from a dive safety standpoint, is you get something called response narrowing. Response narrowing is where you can only respond in an emergency or a crisis situation using skills that are recently practiced and reinforced. So even though you exchanged air a dozen times in a pool session years ago, if you haven't done it recently, you're not going to be able to successfully do it in a crisis situation. Lack of training, experience, and qualification, or diving at what I call diving outside your personal safety envelope or your experience envelope, if you want to call it that. And that personal safety envelope uh, involves things, for example, like experience. Recent experience is much more important than your certification card. Your certification card simply means you took a course at some point in time and you passed the skills uh, in the written test. It has nothing to do with your abilities, it has nothing to do with your qualifications as a diver. 
and your recently practiced skills are essential because once you're underwater, that sea card means nothing. It's not going to do anything for you. Your skills are what's going to do things for you. Your skills are going to allow you to enjoy that dive and really enjoy it safely. Training is important. Certification is important, of course. You have to have a certification. Qualification, which is different than certification, that is more relevant to uh, your recent experience and abilities. Technology, you have to have the right technology for the dives you're going to be making. So the right equipment for the right dive is very, very important. And remember, you always have the ability to say no. And I've said no a number of times. There are a number of dives that I've gone on, traveled around the country, and all of a sudden I get to a place, and for some reason or other, I just don't feel like today is the day. And so I'll say, no, I'm not going to do the dive today. And I'll wait till the next dive, wait till tomorrow. So you can always say no. You can always make a dive another day. So no recent familiarity with critical skills or equipment. We've talked about that. You need to practice and reinforce those skills, preferably underwater. Limited uh, over learning of critical skills. You can only do it so many times in a pool session. And after that, it's up to you. It's up to you and your diving companion to practice and reinforce those skills. No recent practice or reinforcement of the basic and emergency skills we talked about before. Something called rehearsal. Because you can't always practice the skills underwater. Right? Ideally, that would be the place to do it. But rehearsal is and what I used to call proper pre-dive procedure. We would practice those skills using the same muscle groups before we got in the water. Standing on the boat, standing on the shore, we'd practice those skills to make sure that we could at least do those. And it would be better, of course, to do them underwater. Now, there's also something called static rehearsal, and I'm going to have a video here in just a second. Okay. Um, static rehearsal. And static rehearsal is where you simply read a book or look at a video uh, or do things where you're not actually doing things physically. You're actually just watching or reading about things. And here's the video. Here's Uh, so, again, static rehearsals, so you don't really get a lot of benefit from watching videos or reading books or those kind of things. You just like, to reinforce your knowledge, but not your skills. So you need something called dynamic practice. And dynamic practice is where you're actually using the same muscle groups to do those skills. So that involves possibly in shallow water going through the procedures for the exchange of air, whatever method you use, uh, or actually the action of getting rid of your weights and all the things that necessarily involve uh, some psychomotor skills because you're reinforcing all those muscle groups. So dynamic rehearsal is very, very important, uh, even though it is much more important to do it physically underwater. And I know some people who actually will do uh, an exchange of air when they get to their safety stop. So they'll do a dive, come to the safety stop, and they're in 10 or 15 feet of water. And then uh, as they go to the surface, they'll exchange air up to the surface to reinforce that skill. So that's one possibility. So in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, they are not. So deviate from standard pre-dive procedures and protocols is one reason why accidents occur. And I can sometimes be a very annoying person on a dive boat <laughs> because I want to learn about everybody's equipment. I want to I want to know what everybody's using because you never know when somebody's going to have a problem. And I need to be prepared to be able to deal with it the best I can. So on this trip, actually, I was in the Philippines and I was going through the equipment other people were using just to see if it was, if I knew how the equipment worked. And sometimes I learn things. Sometimes I see things I've never seen before that improve my diving. Uh, sometimes I see things that don't improve my diving, nor the other person's diving. So I may call it to their attention or simply ask, you know, what is it that you're doing and how does this work? And 
Sometimes we find things that do work, do work well, sometimes we don't. So there's something called normalization of deviance. And normalization of deviance actually came from the conception disaster. That's when I heard the term for the first time. It actually was first coined uh, with the reports on the space shuttle disasters because they knew that the O-rings did not function very well in cold, but they launched anyway. And when they launched, it worked. And they continued to launch, even though they knew there was a potential problem with those O-rings uh, in the space shuttle. And it worked until it did. And of course, the result was catastrophic. But I listened to the four and a half hours of the investigative report from the National Tra Transportation Safety Board about the conception disaster. That's that little board in California where 34 divers died because it caught fire and they got trapped down below in the living quarters. Uh, it wasn't really a diving disaster, but it involved diving uh, personnel and, and, and divers. And so normalization of deviance is the, is the fact where you do deviate from standard operating procedures and it becomes normalized over time. And it's actually a shortcut. So divers, for various reasons, take shortcuts, either to speed things up in preparation or it's not as convenient for them to follow the procedures as uh, outlined. So they take shortcuts. And those shortcuts can lead uh, to serious issues. So the shortcuts are rewarded when these deviations or shortcuts do not result in uh, a problem. So if it works, you continue to do it because you're reinforced that it works. And these shortcuts become normal, over normalized or normal operating procedure over time. And so you continue to make that shortcut over and over and over again until it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, it's a real problem. So when it works, it works. But when it doesn't, the results can be catastrophic. This is a screen grab from a video that you may have seen. It's a dive group that were finishing a dive. And the person who was taking the video is looking around all the divers. They're turning to each other. They're putting thumbs up. And they're all identifying, yeah, thumbs up, and they start their ascent, except for this person. And if you look at her, she's back in the back of the group. And what she does before she starts her ascent is she dumps the air out of her VCE. So everybody is going to the surface, and she's swimming, she's swimming, she's swimming, and all of a sudden her feet hit the bottom. So she's not going up, she's going down, which is not uncommon, by the way. Um, so her feet hit the bottom, and all of a sudden, full-fledged panic. So she ripped her mask off, ripped her regulator out, and she's clawing her way to the surface while the other people are trying to, to control her ascent, trying to give her air to the regulators. Uh, and luckily, she made it to the surface alive. But the problem was that she had evidently been told that there's a problem with the air expanding in your dry suit and the air expanding in your BCD, and you may have difficulty dealing with that. So in order to keep from dealing with that, she simply dumped all the air out. So therefore, she was negatively buoyant and she started her ascent. And there are situations in the diving fatality record where people went to exchange air and they're exchanging air and doing it very, very well, and all of a sudden their feet hit the bottom because they stopped kicking. So that's another reason why whenever you practice the exchange of air, it's got to involve an ascent. You've got to be ascending to the surface. So every shortcut has a price, and that price can be greater than the reward. So shortcuts are a real serious problem. So again, wide axis occur, deviate from standard pre-dive preparation protocols, no pre-dive communication between diving companions, how to talk to your buddies. And make sure that everybody has the same level of information because we all have to make the same decision during the dive. No pre dive equipment check and evaluation. Make sure that you are as familiar with your partner's equipment as you are with your own and your partner the same way. So I want to make sure my diving companion knows my equipment well in case something happens where you need to help me out. No use of a pre dive checklist or pre dive ritual to assure proper preparation. I do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Sometimes vary depending on the different type of equipment I may be using, but I do the same thing over and over again, and I have a checklist. Checklists are very, very important. And also, I have something called my rule of three. And my rule of three is when I make three mistakes in my dive preparation, I stop and rethink my preparation for the dive. So checklists, checklists are very important. In fact, this was uh, something that came from the consensus statement from the Rebreather Forum 3.0 that was supported by Divers Alert Network in 2012. And said the Rebreather Forum acknowledged the overwhelming evidence demonstrating the efficacy of checklists and preventing error. Checklists are essential, absolutely essential, especially if you're using something as complicated and complex as a rebreather. Okay, also, access security because of problems with the equipment, again, user error, a lack of familiarity with or functional understanding of equipment use. You want to make sure you understand your equipment well before you ever use it in a situation that calls for your ability to use it very, very well and, very, and completely. This is actually the photograph uh, testing that we did on the first Nitrox computer uh, off the coast of Wilmington, North Carolina. 
No practice backup plan for equipment related issues. You have to make sure that you talk about things so that if something happens and something doesn't work, you have another thing that does work. So you have another plan or a backup plan uh, in case equipment doesn't work as it was designed. So this came from a guy named George Harper, who ran the hyperbaric facility at, in Tobermory, Ontario in Lake Huron. He was also the physician who did almost all the inquests of diving fatalities in Ontario. He said, we're not able to document a single case in which equipment malfunction directly caused a diver's death or injury. It has been the diver's response to the problem, which results in the pathology. In other words, diver error. This is a photograph I took uh, at a quarry in North Carolina when I was working there. And this diver came out of the water with a dry suit on. He squatted down and evacuated the air out of the dry suit, stood up. And there on the inside of the dry suit was his weight belt. So he had his weight belt on the inside of his dry suit. And in diving safety terminology, we call that natural selection. <laughs> and I went over and talked to him. I said, why do you have your weight belt on the inside of your dry suit? He said, look at me, I have no hips. And the weight belt kept slipping off. And I said, well, there are harnesses and other things you could use to keep that from happening. Um, and he just didn't think it was a problem. No one brought it to his attention that it was an issue until I did. So limited exercise tolerance, what fits your exercise schedule better, exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day. So physical exercise is very, very important. Of course, cardiovascular fitness. The doctor asked me to spend at least one hour per day on the treadmill, and it shouldn't be used as something to sleep on. You should actually be exercising on it. Uh, thermal stress, uh, this is... Actually, that's correct BCD again, and uh, here we are the first time I went to the Antarctic in 2018, and we're diving on a wreck called the Governor Norton, which is a whaling ship that caught fire uh, in about 1900, and in order to save the whale oil and the passengers and crew, they ran it aground, and it's sitting upright in the, on the surface there, and the stern is 60 feet below the surface. Uh, it's really a very, very interesting dive. So you can get overheated, even in places like the Antarctic, where the water temperature is 30 degrees. Uh, the air temperature was relatively warm. It was about 25, but we have bright sunshine, and you can't get really overheated inside the dry suit with cold weight underground. Failure to recognize signs or symptoms or denial. That's one of the big issues. You would think that that when I worked at Divers Alert Network, our medical department would get calls on the weekend about divers who may be injured from a diving experience. Rarely did our medical department get a call from a distressed diver on the weekend. Most often they got calls on Tuesday or Wednesday. Not when the person had symptoms, but when the symptoms wouldn't go away. So this is something I want to mention very briefly, body mass index. Even though body mass index, index is not a direct, it doesn't have a direct correlation with your physical fitness, but there are places around the world that want to know your body mass index before they'll allow you to die without a medical uh, form being signed by a physician. In fact, in places in Australia, uh, in order to take the scuba course, you have to have a body mass index less than 30. Uh, and if you don't, then you have to have your, your form signed by a physician giving you authorization to die. And you can see that people who are overweight and obese are overrepresented in the fatality database. So, lessons applied. Always follow standard pre-dive procedures and protocols. Have a pre-dive communication between uh, diving companions. Make sure you and your partners talk about the dive you're going to make and all the things you're going to experience and all the things you're going to enjoy on the dive. Conduct a pre-dive equipment check and evaluation. Make sure not only everything is there, but everything works, and you know that everything functions. Always use a checklist or pre-dive ritual. Uh, use both. So I use a checklist, and I do the same thing over and over again uh, as I prepare for each dive. So use safe and conservative practices. Dive within your limits and experience. Again, dive your recent experience, not your certification card. I don't care what it says on your certification card. You need to have recent experience. That's what gives you the tools and knowledge. To be able to not only enjoy the dive, be able to deal with any situation that occurred while you're underwater. And this actually is a photo, because um, you have to avoid diving conditions that may exceed your recent experience or ability. This is a photo I took, and I was actually supposed to be on that boat. So we're diving in Socorro, uh, which is a couple hundred miles off the coast of Mexico. And I got that morning, my dive companion and I were talking about the dive. We looked out, the wind was blowing, the waves were higher than we expected. There was a real strong current, surface current blowing, and we looked at each other and said, no. Not today, or at least not now. So we chose not to make that dive, and we were uh, actually waiting for conditions to change, which they did later in the day, and it was really ideal later that afternoon. So I also recommend that people use safe conservative practices using nitrox, a nitrox blend, with your dive computer on the air setting, or if you use dive tables, most people don't anymore, uh, then use air dive tables. But for example, I have, except in this room, and 
in this area, I've not breathed air in probably seven or eight years. So every dive I make, I'm breathing a nitrox mix, and my dive computer has never come off of the air section because that gives me a level of conservatism, especially at my age, that I'm comfortable with. So I think it's very important, especially for older divers, to be using a mechanism like this. So using a nitrox blend uh, with your air computer set on the air set. In fact, it's used so frequently by older divers, they call it geezer gas, <laughs> which is okay. I don't mind that at all. But you also need to have a nitrox training course. So you take a course because you want to understand the use of nitrox, because it certainly is not a deep diving gas. So you want to understand the limits and benefits of using any kind of gas mixture, which is other than air. So you say in conservative practices we talked about before, and scuba diving was a sport that invented social distancing. Hang on. Practice slow ascents and safety stops. This is a series of dives. Actually, I was in the Bahamas doing a series of dives, and my companion back there and behind me is uh, Dr. Jose Jones, who's a co-founder of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. And you can see that at our safety stop, he is in the full lotus position. And you can see that I'm not. <laughs> because I could not get, I'm not as flexible as he was. And he was 80 years old at the time, so I was not nearly as flexible as he was. Conservative dive computer settings, as I mentioned before, I think that's important to be situationally aware. Uh, situational awareness has to do with things, for example, like making sure you understand your breathing gas plane, communicate that to your diving companions. Your bottom time relative to your dive plane, you want to make sure you don't violate your dive plane. Your depth, current, surge, visibility, anything that can affect your performance during the dive or affect your ability to dive safety, safely and successfully. Uh, position location to entry and exit point, because you want to make sure that when the dive is over, you don't have a mile-long swim back to the boat or back to the shore, uh, and you want to make sure that you're actually going to enter and exit pretty close to the same position. Workload, because your workload, you're, you're doing more work underwater, you're breathing more gas that's causing uh, your body to absorb more nitrogen, and therefore that could increase your susceptibility to decompression sickness. Overhead conditions, make sure that you don't go into overhead environments unless you're fully qualified and trained and equipped. Uh, this is actually a photo that came from a video, it's a screen grab, where this guy is a spear fisherman, there's his spear gun right there. He surfaced, the first thing he saw was a speeding boat coming right at his head. And, and of course that can do some serious damage not only to the boat but to him. And he admitted, actually he was interviewed by the newspaper in Florida, and he admitted that he had uh, just decided not to take a dive flight that day even though he knew he was supposed to take a dive plane, so the boat didn't even know he was in water, and he popped up in, right in front of the boat. So anything that could compromise your safety, you just need to make sure you're aware of all those things as you're planning and executing your dive. So practice slow ascents and safety stops, be conservative with dive, dive computer settings, situationally aware, carry safety and signaling equipment. Uh, the guy there on the right-hand side is Bob Evans. He's the guy that invented the force spin. Um, and Bob and I are looking at our safety sausage. You can see mine is bigger than his. And in this particular case, I have the Dan Safety Sausage, which is the only one that I know of that actually has a metallic strip in it, uh, to making it making it visible on radar. Uh, or you can have a surface float, or you can use a communication devices to be able to communicate. Uh, this is something called Nautilus Lifeline. that has nothing to do with that company. That when you come to the surface and you activate it, it actually sends a man overboard signal to all the boats in the area. And also Garmin. Garmin has uh, this particular device that has two-way communication ability and uh, can be activated uh, from the dive computer that Garmin makes. Uh, in fact, uh, here I am, and this is a dive I made in Tasmania a couple of years ago, and I'm wearing my electronic device just in case I need it out there in the open water. Take a break after multiple days, multiple days of diving, you know, even though the dive boat or the, the living board, for example, may offer you five dives a day, you don't have to do them all. I do just the ones I'm comfortable with. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help because you're on a boat, you're paying people to help you, why not take advantage of that? Uh, have an easy exit ladder with a pull-up bar, make it easier to get out of the water. Uh, you can don and off your equipment in the water if necessary because the equipment is heavy. Or you can do things that aren't quite as heavy. You can use side mounts where you simply clip those cylinders on once you get in the water, clip them off when you get back to the boat, and you can climb up the ladder without the cylinders on your back. Or you can use different side cylinders that may be a little bit lighter. Or there is something called the Avello system, and this is photo taken in Maui. A year or so ago when I was doing the test dives on it. It's new equipment. It's 15 pounds lighter than an 80. Uh, it also contains 160 cubic feet of air. It's a little bit larger than an 80, 80 cubic foot cylinder. And with that cylinder, it has internal buoyancy controls inside the cylinder. You don't wear a BCU. And it works like a ballast tank of a submarine. And I was doing the dives in Maui with a 5 mil suit. I normally wear 18 pounds of lead. I was wearing 4 pounds of lead. 
And a friend of mine, uh, actually Jennifer Idle, who you're going to be interviewing here shortly, uh, she used that Avella system was able to take 50% of the lead off of her weight belt in the dry suit. And so it's made by a company called Avella. And be realistic about your health. Health is really a big issue in diving safety nowadays. Consider a return to diving physical if you've been out of the water for a while. And if you're going to do that, make sure it's a physician familiar with diving medicine and your life priorities. You need to make sure your physician understands how important diving is to you. But it shouldn't be so important that it puts you at risk or the people you dive with. And the damn medical department, um, they provide consultation to your physician. All you have to do is give that number. They can call and talk to the medical department at Dan and get uh, expert advice. Or anytime there's a sudden or noticeable change in your health, either mental or physical, <laughs> you need to make sure that you, you do seek advice from a physician. Uh, and you're talking before about these are those triggering events we talked about from that report that was done in 2008. In 2015, Divers Boat Network did another analysis of fatalities, and the number one trigger event was now underlying health issues. So cardiac issues and other underlying health issues are really, really important as far as diving safety is concerned. So remember your health, any sudden or noticeable change, uh, have a physical examination, and this is something that came from Rebreather Forum 4.0 that just took place in Malta about a month ago, and their consensus statement included this. The Rebreather Forum 4.0 endorses the principle of periodic cardiac health surveillance with an emphasis on targeted annual or biennial evaluation for divers older than 45, even in apparent good health. So I would strongly recommend an annual fiscal for divers over the age of 45, even if you are in apparent good health. But again, uh, for the physician who understands diving medicine and your life priorities, in fact, uh, two years ago, I did my cardiac evaluation. I went to the local hospital in Driggs, where I live and they were able to do the evaluation for me. Uh, you can also get a referral position from Diver Boat Network. There's over 700 positions in the referral network. Uh, no recent familiarity with critical skills or equipment. <laughs> I was diving actually with the people, the Mel Fisher's people, and this was a young lady who uh, supposedly was experienced and did an entry and did a giant face plant out there in the ocean. Uh, your skills do degrade over a period of time. They need to be practiced and reinforced regularly. Uh, and if you are returning to diving after being away for a while, a refresher course is a good idea. A dive with an instructor. Start with benign dives with plenty of bottom reference. Uh, maybe use a downline or anchor on. And dive in a familiar location. All those things will make it easier for you to get back into the sport. And be conservative. Always be conservative. I think that's a very, very important thing for everybody. Uh, when returning to diving, take your time. Dive only when you are fully prepared and comfortable. Uh, do slow, controlled descents and descents. Safety stops, of course, everybody does that on the ascent. I actually do safety stops on the descent. So about 10 feet or 15 feet below the surface, uh, I always stop and check with my buddies, are you okay, before we start our, uh, continue our descent to the bottom. And make sure that everybody's okay before we continue to dive. So don't confuse hand signals. Okay, that's okay, the okay signal that you use, that means to send the dive is over, uh, not as the Fonz were saying, hey, that was a great dive. Uh, so only use hand signals that are appropriate for the dive, and that means ascend and the dive is over when you put your thumbs up. So divers, safe divers should not be afraid to say no. And remember, anybody can call a dive at any time for any reason whatsoever. Once the thumb comes up, the dive is over. So cascade toward the turning we talked about before, making the right decision. If you have a trigger event, you make the right decision, and it doesn't go into that cascade, in my opinion. The right decision should be made here before that trigger never happens. So, last thing here, the four P's of diving safety. Plan, prepare, practice. And practice is important. Don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. And perform. So use all the skills that you've been taught to make sure that you are not only diving safely, but enjoyably, because that's the reason we're diving in the first place. We want to have a great time. So this came from uh, Sully Sullenberger. One way of looking at this is, of course, he was the pilot of uh, 1549 that landed in the Hudson River. One way of looking at this might be that for 45, shoot, 42 years, I've been making small regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training. On January 15, 2009, the balance was sufficient, so very large withdrawal, not only saving his life, but the life of everybody on board that plane. Same thing can be said for diving. So every diving experience, you are making those small regular deposits in the bank of experience, education, and training. And hopefully you'll never be required to make a major withdrawal, but if you do, you're ready for it. 
There's the sound. <laughs> Any articles, these are articles I've written about diving safety, and I'll be happy to send you the links. And also, my wife and I, Betty, back in the back, she and I wrote a book, uh, 101 Tips for Recreational Divers. And just like I've been talking here, it's hard for me to stop. <laughs> so it's really more than 101 tips. Uh, but I, you actually can get those from Amazon or a company called uh, WiseDivers.com. So diving safety is no accident, and thank you all very much. And there is my email address. So. Feel free to email me anytime with any question because I'm involved in a lot of different things in diving. I'm the chairman of the board of the Dive Trade Association, DEMA. I uh, work with Force Blue, a veterans organization. Uh, I'm the chairman of the board of the Best Country Company. And I'm also Wound Care Education Partners and a number of other things. So um, I'm involved with a lot of different things. I'll be happy to research whatever you have a question about and get you an answer. So Dan, we have some internet questions that came in while you're while you were chatting, um, but we were all so enthralled that we didn't want to disturb you. So if you'll step over there so we can see you, though, I'll tell you what. Let's see, where's that? There it is. Now we can see you. Oh, there we go. So uh, Dave Benai writes in and he says, uh, "What can we do to lower our fatality rates?" Well, a number of things I talked about there. For one thing, make sure that you practice your skills regularly. Uh, make sure that they are. Um, reinforce constantly, so if you have to use them in a crisis, you can very quickly and efficiently. Make sure that you are in good health, especially for people who are over the age of 45. Have a regular physical from a physician familiar with diving medicine, and again, somebody that understands how important diving is to you. Again, not to endanger yourself or anybody else, but to make sure that that person understands that diving is an important part of your life. And those physicals are very, very important because as we saw, uh, the 2015 data that Dan analyzed, uh, the number one trigger event was now underlying health issues. So uh, uh, Bennett uh, writes and he says, of these cardiac events, can we pin down what is the primary cause of the car cardiac events? Is it a lack of uh, uh, movement and exercise prior to coming out to diving? What uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if anybody has a real answer for that. But one thing that I mentioned early on was that during COVID, people have not gone to their healthcare provider for re regular checkups. And because of that, they may be more vulnerable to things where the body is put under a lot of stress. And when you look at things, for example, that may precipitate a cardiac event, like arrhythmias, um, what causes an arrhythmia are things, for example, like immersion, and can't do anything about that as a diver, uh, things, for example, like the work of breathing uh, and cold and emotional stress. And as I mentioned earlier, emotional stress is a big issue because you have people coming back to the sport that have been away for a long time. They get in the water that's really over their head, no pun intended. Uh, and all of a sudden they have a crisis, they can't deal with it, and that turns into something more serious. But um, I don't think anybody really knows exactly what those causes are for uh, that increase in cardiac events. Uh, Matt Eklund uh, writes, and he says, I was lobster diving off of Catalina with a buddy and another uh, pair of buddies, two plus two. I got low on air around uh, 90 feet uh, during a night dive. I was uh, signaled by my buddy uh, and said, uh, let's go up. I'm low on air, 700, 800 PSI. He told me to go up uh, to, to the boat um, and he would stay with the other divers. I wasted about 100 PSI trying to get to him, uh, and, uh, but he didn't want to come up with me. He didn't, uh, want, to, uh, he didn't want me to, to stay either. Uh, what is a good way to address that at the surface without being a uh, burner of bridges? I handled it by turning off my light and, and clipping it to my BC and heading up. Well, um, one of the photographs I showed was I made a stop at 10 feet below the boat, and my buddy and I were looking at each other, giving the okay. Shortly after that photo was taken, that guy who gave me the okay grabbed his stomach because his breakfast didn't agree with him on that dive. So there were three of us in that dive group. So what we had talked about before the dive even started, that if something happened to one of us, all three of us would come back to the surface, and either all three of us would get out of the water, or we would at least wait until that person is completely on the boat, up on the deck, before we finished our dive. Right on. But if, again, that's communication. So that's one thing you have to talk about. You have to make sure that everybody agrees that if something happens, there is something that you will do where no one is put at risk. Ryan Lanta writes in, he says, for Dan, if our physician isn't a diver or understand dive physics, how do we find a doctor to conduct those physicals? 
Well, Divers Boat Network has a referral physician network that has over 700 physicians all over North America that are of almost every specialty. So all you have to do is call the Dan Medical Department. They're available for those calls, nine to five, Monday through Friday. I don't work there anymore, by the way. Um, but they're available and they can advise your physician on what to do. Your physician can actually talk to a physician at Dan, or they can give you the name of a physician in your area that can conduct a physical like that. Fantastic. That's all the questions we had. Good. Anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious what you think is um, what begins to be a dangerous current speed. I've been <laughs> on a dive boat before and there's crazy yeah. currents and I'm like, let's go. And it's crazy on there. It's yeah. just like fish are going everywhere and the sea weeds down. Well, for one thing, if you don't feel comfortable when the current's too strong. Um, and there really is no way of determining what would be a Current that you could actually swim against, it doesn't take more than a couple of knots. I mean, that's a real strong current to try to dive against a couple of knots of current. Uh, there are places that I've been where there is a strong current, and then we either do a drift dive, or what we'll do is use a downline, go to the bottom, and then work our way along the bottom and back up to the anchor line again or the downline again. So you're not having to swim against the current. But uh, that's going to, one thing, make the dive a lot less enjoyable, uh, but also it's going to cause you to breathe a lot harder, where your body's going to absorb a lot more nitrogen that could increase your risk. So I would just, whatever you feel uncomfortable with, the dive is open. And there are a lot of times, I mentioned before, that I want to dive and there's just something about the dive that I don't like, uh, that I don't feel comfortable with, and I'll call the dive. And my partners and I have already decided beforehand that if any of us give the thumb up, the dive is over, and we all go to the surface. So you want to make sure the dive is enjoyable. That's what it's all about. Where do you learn about currents and how to read them? Well, there are places, I'm not sure, well, you have current here, you have a river. Uh, I'm not sure how much diving is actually done in the river, in the Snake River, but when I was teaching in Ohio for many, many years, we used to go up to the St. Clair River in Michigan, where we would actually teach divers to deal with a current. The current is almost always about a knot to a knot and a half, which is still relatively strong if you have to swim long distances. Yes, it gave people an opportunity to experience current under controlled conditions. You taught them how to see and maybe what the current was like. Yeah. 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 So if, if you have the luxury of being able to, I'm not sure. Right, what you do here in the Snake River, but uh, that would be a place if it is safe to do. I'm not really sure. Yeah, one of the uh, answers to that question is really easy. Is you happen to have a a, a, a chubby pirate that is a fantastic uh, river diver and spent a few minutes uh, diving uh, currents, and uh, quite a few of us have built currents as well. But uh, uh, Brett actually has a river diving uh, specialty that is taught here, and, and actually can take you out to the rivers and actually work with that. So there, there is a there is a river diving specialty for that. Yeah, and there's a friend of mine actually that uh, used to work at the Uni University of Michigan. He developed a device which is like a handlebar with two spikes on the bottom. And he would go like that along the bottom, holding himself against the current. Uh, and that way it made it pretty easy to move against the current. You didn't have to swim. So I do everything I can not to have to kick. I mean, if you can pull yourself along the bottom, that's fine. Or pull yourself along a wreck, that's fine. Can't really do that if there's a lot of coral. You should be handling the coral, of course. But if there's a wreck there or something, you can pull yourself against so you don't have to swim yeah. and overjudge yourself. More questions, Brian? Any other? <laughs> your most satisfying dive. So not your My most. Oh, your that's tough. That is really tough. Ah, Prince Eugen was good. I really enjoyed that. Um, but I'll tell you, probably my my most satisfying dive was in Lake Huron. Yeah. Uh, there was a wreck there called the Arabia. The Arabia sank in 1885, um, and she was carrying a full cargo of corn. And she was uh, located, uh, I think, in the early or the late 1960s. And we were diving her in the 1970s. And you can actually go down into the hull, because it's upright on the bottom, intact. And you can actually pick up corn from the corn cargo she was carrying in 1985. The bowsprit was still sticking out. All, both anchors are still mounted in place. The ship's wheel is still there. Uh, and it's such an exciting dive. We used to be able to go down to a mooring block. And then the visibility wasn't that good in Lake Huron. And you would swim along the line until you saw the silhouette of the sailing ship sitting up right on the bottom. Well, fantastic job. Actually, all this. And now the visibility is about 100 feet there because the zebra mussels have cleared up the water. And it did. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Perfect. Thank you all very much. Dan, thank you. Oh, my thank you. Thank you. As always. Dan.